I'm glad that you have joined us once again for this Bible presentation. You remember that in our last two presentations, we've been looking at the subject of Babylon. We looked at what Babylon is. We also dealt with the subject of the wine of Babylon. We discovered that wine in the Bible simply means doctrine. So basically, we looked at what are some of the doctrines that are found in Babylon which are not biblical. But I then realized that uh, Babylon is so hooked up on prophecy. Everywhere you turn your TV, everywhere you look, mushrooming prophets calling themselves. So because of the importance of this subject of prophecy, of which the whole world today is hooked on, we decided that we are going to look at the subject of the gift of prophecy. The intention of this Bible study today is to try as much as possible to give you the skills that you need to identify true prophets, at the same time also identifying false prophets. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us. The opportunity once again to dive into the scriptures and mine the great truths of life that are found therein. Today we look at the subject of the gift of prophecy. So we invite your spirit, the author of scriptures, that he will give us the necessary understanding that we need in dealing with this subject. Equip us because spiritual things are spiritually descend, and the whole world today is hooked on prophecy, but perhaps the wrong prophecy. So give us the truth according to your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Today, like I said, I'm going to deal with the subject of the gift of prophecy, entitled God's Guiding Gift. Now, of all the gifts that God has ever given to humanity, the greatest is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and the universe. The one who spoke worlds into existence. The one who became a baby in the manger. The one who gave his own life so that you and I can have life. He's the greatest gift that God has ever given to humanity. But apart from that, with him also comes other gifts that are of great importance. And one of those gifts is the gift of prophecy. Perhaps the question is, what necessitated the gift of prophecy? The Bible in the book, in, in, in terms of the structure that we are going to look at today, the structure of the Bible study is such that we are going to look at what is the gift of prophecy. And then we are going to look at the work and functions of a prophet. Then we're going to look at how do we identify true prophets. And then the, perhaps the question is, uh, will there be prophets after the biblical canon? Because there are people that believe that with the close or with the death of John the Baptist, the writer of the book of Revelation, there are no more prophets. Then we are going to end with the question, is Ellen G. White a true prophet. And today, that is the structure that we are going to perhaps look at. Perhaps the a question is, why the gift of prophecy? When man was created, he was perfect when he came from the hands of the creator. Everything about him was beautiful. He was simple. He was handsome. But with, the, with that also meant that with man in his pure state, God could communicate to man face to face in fact, God would come in the coolness of the day and have a conversation with Adam and with Eve. They were pure, they were holy, there was no sin in them. And because of that, the communication between God and his created being, which has always been the desire of God to dwell with his people. And so in the book of Exodus, for example, chapter 20, verse 8, he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell with them. What we see in the book of Matthew also is God with us, so-called Emmanuel. In the book of Revelation, in the future, the Bible talks about how the tabernacle of God shall be with men. So you see the desire of the creator, or the desire of God has always been that man should be with his creator. But with the coming in of sin, 
that was done away with because sin, according to the Bible, it separates us from God. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2, your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you. So God cannot communicate the same way he used to communicate with Adam and Eve with us because now we are in sin. And because of that, certain changes took place in human beings that made it impossible for God to communicate with us the way he used to communicate to man before man fell. Because if you and I communicated with God the same way we used to communicate prior to the entrance of sin into this world, we would actually be dead because God is holy and us, we are sinners. God cannot be in the presence, sin cannot exist in the presence of God. So there are certain changes that took place in man that made it impossible for God to continue communicating with man in the same way. But those changes also meant that God had to find another way of communicating with human beings and that way, my brothers and sisters, is what is called the gift of prophecy. So today, I want to look at what are some of the changes that took place in man when he sinned. For example, he could no longer see God face to face. That is in Exodus chapter 33 verse 20. Man can no longer see God face to face. Man would die. Number two, he came to know evil as well as good. Genesis chapter 3 verse 22. Behold, the man has become like us, knowing both good and evil. He became afraid. So fear comes in with sin. And the Bible says the fearful will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he became afraid. Why? Because he had committed sin. And with sin comes in fear. He became subject to death. When Adam and Eve were created, they were not subject to death until sin came into this world. And when sin came into this world, my brothers and sisters, the rest is history. We all know what death, that death has been with us for a long, long time. But at the same time also, he began defending himself against God's inquiries. We all like defending ourselves. We all like blaming other individuals. And our minds were corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. What else? We became carnally minded. And you know, someone who is carnal cannot understand the things of God. Because of these changes, my brothers and sisters, these changes that have taken place in us, these changes that took place in Adam and Eve, the gift of prophecy became a necessity. God has to find another way to communicate with mankind. Now, how has God in the past communicated with the human race? What other ways has God communicated with the human race? Perhaps we could look at some of those. Apart from the gift of prophecy, which we are going to extensively look at today, God has in other past times communicated with human beings. And I have just tried to put up some of those ways. Angels. God has communicated in time past through angels, still communicates even today through angels. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? He has communicated to human beings through created works so that there's none who's got an excuse. You cannot say that you are related to a chimpanzee because the created works speaks explicitly of a loving creator. He has communicated through what is called a Urim and a Thunam. Now Urim and Thunam are the two stones that the high priest used to wear on his breast place. Okay, so on the chest of the high priest there would be two stones and those two stones would light up and if, if the Urim or the, the, the Thunam lit up, it communicated a certain message, either a yes or a no. So if, for example, a Urim lit up, it would be perhaps a, a no answer from God. If it was a thunam, then it would be a yes answer. So the high priest used to use that when they came before the presence of God. Dreams. 
The Bible talks about how that saw was not communicated to either by dreams or by visions. First Samuel chapter 28, verse 6. The voice from God, from heaven, beloved son of mine, hear him. That we find in the book of Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, at the baptism of Christ and at the Mount of Transfiguration. The Holy Spirit and the individual. This is the way walk in it. Even today, God still communicates to us in that way. And number seven, Christ in person. In time past, God communicated to us by the prophets and all these other methods, but he has in these last days spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul writes to the Hebrews. But I want to understand, and I want you to understand very clearly, that these methods that God has communicated to are not sufficient enough, apart from Christ, are not sufficient enough in revealing the entire will of God. In revealing the entire will of God, or the secrets of God, God instituted the office of prophets. Prophets would then receive the gift of prophecy. So when they receive the gift of prophecy, their work is then to get the message from God and communicate it to human beings. So they were to be then the what? The mouth beast. Whilst a priest gets the burden of human beings to God, the prophet, on the other hand, gets the message from God and communicates it to human beings. So, brothers and sisters, Amos chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible says, Surely the Lord will do how many things? Nothing. But he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. You see, the prophets are the servants of God. Of course, when we're talking about true prophets, God will do how many things? Nothing. He will reveal everything that concerns your salvation and anything that concerns <clears throat> my salvation. God will reveal that to the prophets. And what will be the work of the prophets to communicate it to human beings? To give it to human beings. This is the message that God has given. So prophets don't have any work of modifying the message that God has given them. Prophets simply receive and they have to do what? They have to communicate. So Amos chapter 3 verse 7 is very clear that God will do nothing. He will communicate his secrets to the prophets. So before God does anything, he will communicate to the prophets. And the prophets reveal that message to us, the children of God, and to the world. But at the same time also, before God destroys a nation, he will communicate to the prophet and send the prophet to that nation, and that nation will have to hear the message from the prophet. If they reject the message, there are consequences for that. Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. If there be a prophet among you, did you get that? If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. Of course, when the Bible is written, the him there is both male and female. So if there be a prophet among you, now the message there, or the subtle message there, that has to be understood, my brothers and sisters, is that a prophet arises from among God's people. That is very, that has to be understood. A prophet arises from among God's people. Because the message is, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known. The other message that we pick from there is that you don't go to school, to some theological school, to become a prophet. It's a calling, a direct calling in which the nominating committee is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they decide who, male or female, is going to be a prophet. But they choose from among 
God's people. And how will God make himself known to that person? He will speak unto him in a dream. So already I've just given you one of the skills that you need to understand when it comes to prophets. Prophets are not chosen among the heathens. Prophets do not arise from those who do not know God. Prophets arise either from Israel or from spiritual Israel. That point is extremely very important for us to understand. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. At the time the Apostle Peter writes this scripture, it has to be understood what the background is. The Apostle Peter had been describing his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. And on that mount, he heard with his own voice, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. Even with what he heard with his own ears, and saw with his own eyes, the Apostle Peter still says that that is not as sure as the word of prophecy. Do you understand that? So God has elevated his word above his name. And the work that he has given to the prophets is of great importance. And I'll show you that without prophets, you cannot be made perfect. In fact, without prophets, there is no remedy. Brothers and sisters have to understand that apart from the office of being a savior, Christ occupied the office of a prophet. Because he got the messages from God and communicated salvation to people. And that has to be understood. We have also a more sure word of what? Prophecy. Now, if we have a more sure word of prophecy, what should we do? We do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. And why should we do that? Until the day dawn. In other words, until you have understood that you are saved. Until you have understood that you know the way of salvation. Until you have understood that Christ is mine. Until you have understood that Christ has been formed in your heart. That's why the Bible says, until the day star arise in your heart. What else does the scripture say? The Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So in other words, you don't bring in your interpretation into scripture. Why? Because prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It's always been the will of God. It's not the will of man. And because it's not the will of man, you cannot bring in your private interpretation into the scriptures. You cannot bring your private interpretation into prophecy. Scripture becomes its own expositor. Scripture becomes its own explainer. But holy men, did you get that? Holy what? Holy men of God spark as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the office of prophet was occupied by holy men of God. And how did they speak when they were moved by the Holy Ghost? So they spoke under inspiration. They spoke possessed by the Spirit of God. They spoke 
That which the Spirit of God gave them utterance to speak, righteousness, salvation, health, counseling, truth, honesty, integrity. That is what the prophets have spoken. My brothers and sisters, prophecy is not of any private interpretation. You don't call yourself to the office of the prophet. God calls individuals to the office of prophets. And when they are called, they are called from among God's people. So I do not expect that one will rise up from among those who do not know Jesus Christ to rise up and say that, oh, there is a prophet. Or those who have rejected the law of God, and then they rise up and say, oh, there is a prophet. No, it doesn't happen. Scriptures strictly have said that is not possible because prophets rise up from among God's people. That, but at the same time also, prophecy is of a no private interpretation. The book of Amos chapter 3 verse 21, of whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So since the world began, God has been speaking through the mouth of his holy prophets. If you neglect the message that God has given to his holy prophets, you are neglecting the salvation of your own soul. You will not know which way to go without the prophets. You will not know how to be saved without the prophets. The gift of prophecy that eventually gives us the scriptures gives us, my brothers and sisters, one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given to humanity, the word of God. With the gift of prophecy and with inspiration, we have the word of God, where we do well to take heed unto as unto a light that shines until the day dawn. Oh, my brothers and sisters, when we talk about the gift of prophecy, God speaking to his children through human beings. And God has revealed all that pertains to life, all that pertains to health, all that pertains to marriage, all that pertains to financial prosperity, all that pertains to stewardship, all that pertains to um, relationships, everything that pertains to salvation, God has revealed everything that pertains to this life and to the life to come through the gift of prophecy. We do well. We do well, my brothers and sisters, not to neglect that which God has revealed through his servants, the prophets. And the moment we understand that, then we begin to understand why the Bible says this, and the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending. So in other words, prophets would be raised very early in the morning and sent to his children, rising up betimes and sending. Why did God do that? Because he had compassion on his people. God sends prophets because he's got compassion on his people. Why? So that they do not perish. The gift of prophecy is so that you do not perish. So that you understand what the will of God is. So you do not perish. Rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. He has compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words 
and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Without the message of the prophets, there is no remedy. You cannot be saved. without the gift of prophecy. If you know it and you neglect it, to you it is sin. You cannot compare yourself to someone who doesn't know. The one who knows is accountable to what they know. He who doesn't know, in times of ignorance, God winks at. There is no remedy for the church of God, if they neglect the gift of prophecy. Prophets have been caught, prophets have risen, all for the purpose of giving the message of salvation. And the message of salvation is because God has compassion on his people and on his dwelling house. So it becomes of importance, my brothers and sisters, that we pay particular attention to the gift of prophets. What is God speaking through the prophets? So, what is the work of prophets? Well, to get the lesson, we have to understand how the job description of John the Baptist was written by the Holy Spirit. And when the angel Gabriel was speaking to the parents of John the Baptist, the job description of John the Baptist, who Christ says was the greatest prophet ever born from men, the job description becomes the job description for every other prophet that follows thereon. So, sir, if you call yourself a prophet and you do not match According to the job description given to John the Baptist, you are a fake prophet and you called yourself. God never called you, you called yourself. Now, to understand this subject, Luke chapter 1, verse 76, the Bible says, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. Why will you be called the prophet of the highest? For thou shalt, number one, Go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. So prophets go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Number two, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Number three, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And number four, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Praise God. That is the work of prophets, to give light to them that sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death. And to guide our feet. Did you get that? To do what? Guide our feet into the way of peace. So prophets never guide our way into the way of destruction. No, do they bring confusion? They guide our way into the way of peace. Why? Because in that way is the prince of peace. Now today, We've got men and women who have a reason. What they do is that they divide the body of Christ. That's what they do. They divide the body of Christ. Some even call themselves no Christians for Lungu. Others call themselves no Christians for HH. 
my brothers and sisters, Lungu or HH, none of those died for you. Trust is to be exalted. Trust is to be worshipped. The church of God cannot be divided by prophets. A true prophet will unite the church of God. Now, to understand this subject, the Apostle Paul speaks to the Ephesians on the issue of gifts. And what he brings about is why does God give the gifts to his church? In the book of Ephesians, the Bible says, when he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. And he gave some what? Apostles and some prophets. Why did he do that? Why did God give some apostles and why did God give some prophets? The answer is right there in scriptures. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Therefore, we henceforth be no more cho children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the fleet of men, and cunning craftness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So prophets, apostles, or the gifts are given to the church for the, for the perfection of the saints, so that we grow in the stature of trust, so that we are not children in matters of salvation, so that we become men and women strong in the Lord, so that we are not deceived by those who lie in wait with their craftiness, those who will come and talk about things that are not found in scriptures. But because we've got the gift of prophecy that has taught us how trust will come. We've got the gift of prophecy that has taught us about clean and unclean foods. We've got the gift of prophecy that has taught us how to dress. We've got the gift of prophecy that has taught us about the salvation and about the Sabbath. We know what the way of salvation is. All my brothers and sisters, with the gift of prophecy, deception is not supposed to affect us because there is perfection. Why? There is growth. Why there is being established in the truth. Why there is truth made plain and truth made simple and truth made clear through the gift of prophecy so that we are not tossed to and fro. The idea of being tossed and fro, this one comes with this wind of doctrine. Ah, I think that he, what he's saying is the truth. Ah, I think what he's saying is the truth. You lack, you lack the gift of prophecy. And because you don't have the gift of prophecy, or you have not listened to what the prophets have said, anyone can come with anything that is, looks like truth and you will believe. I commend to you the prophets. If you study what the prophets have spoken about or written, you will not be deceived. There will be no need of going to all these lifestyle magazines to try and find out how to live life. No need. That which has been revealed in the scriptures, in the spirit of prophecy, is sufficient. No need. But because you've neglected the gift of prophecy through the scriptures and the testimonies, you are tossed to and fro. You believe every wind of doctrine that comes. Why? Your feet is not grounded. It's not rooted. You are still like a child, still like a baby. Every wind of doctrine you believe. That, my brothers and sisters, is not the intention of God. The intention of God is that when God gives these gifts, 
They help us in our perfection of Christian character. They help us at the same time also in growth in trust. They help us in being rooted in him so that we are not tossed to and flow. That's the reason why most of these so-called prophets that are mushrooming today, they cannot be true prophets. They cannot be true prophets. Because a true prophet edifies the church of God. Now, a number of these are simply dividing the body of Christ. They want to identify themselves with this, this one. They want to identify themselves with this one. A true prophet identifies himself with God alone. Now, if we look at um, the subject of um, testing the prophets, which I want to deal with right now, I want to give you the skills how you can test whether this prophet is a true prophet or they have just sent themselves. Because out there we've got men and women who call themselves prophet whatever, they have just sent themselves. I, I can assure you they have just sent themselves. If it's some of these women, they call themselves prophet whatever with painted lips and earrings and all this, they have just sent themselves. There is nothing Christian about them. They don't even know the word of God. They don't even know anything. But I want to give you the skills yourself so that you can identify whether Prophet X is a true prophet or not. Or they are just running like that servant who, went, who ran to David without a message. By the way, true prophets have a message. And what is the message that true prophets have? It's the first, the second, and the third angel's message. That's what the message the true prophets have. Because that is the message, the last message to a dying world. So if you are carrying any other message, you are not a true prophet. Testing the prophets. Number one, test one, a true prophet's message must be in harmony with the word of God and the law of God. So, you who call yourself a prophet and you are listening to this message, is your message in harmony with the word of God and the law of God? And when we talk about the word of God, we are talking about from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to the book of Revelation. Is your message in harmony with the word of God, but at the same time also, is it in harmony with the law of God? Now, to explain this, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The Bible doesn't say it's because there's some light, no. There is no light. It's zero. That's what happens when you mix truth with error. What you get is deception. It's more likely to be taken than branded truth, branded lies. So what we get here, brothers and sisters, has to be understood that just that test alone qualify, disqualifies a lot of the brothers and sisters out there that just call themselves prophets. Now let me explain to you. To the law and to the testimony, what is the law? Perhaps if we were to ask that question, what is the law? Now, theologians will tell you that the first five books of the Bible are called the books of the law, written by Moses. They are called the books of the law. Now, why are they called the books of the law? Because in those first five books, you'll find all the laws that were intended by God to govern man's life. An example, in those first five books of the Bible, you find the law of time. What is the law of time? Evening and morning is the first day. So the day, biblically speaking, doesn't begin at zero, one, zero, zero. It begins at sunset. Evening and morning were the first day. God cast in stone, fixed it. The first week of creation becomes an example for all successive weeks. All throughout generation, as long as time shall last. So a week 
we always run in circles of seven. A day will always begin, biblically speaking, at sunset. Evening and morning were the first day. But at the same time also, what law of time do we find there? Wake six days, rest the seventh day. In the seventh day is a law of time and is a law of work. God commands us to wait for six days and rest on the seventh day. What else do we find there? We find the Ten Commandments, which governs the morality of man. That's what is called the moral law. It governs man's relationship with man and governs man's relationship with God. The first four deals with our relationship with our Creator. The last six deals with our relationship with other fellow men. What else do we find there? We find the health laws. What you can eat and what you cannot eat. So, if you as a prophet, your so-called prophet, you come today and then you tell people, oh, everything was nailed on the cross by trust so you can eat pork, you can eat a pig. You don't understand. You just don't understand what you're talking about. And because of that disqualified, you cannot be a true prophet. Because a true prophet will recognize that health laws were not done away at the cross. They were not done away at the cross. The death of Christ did not take away sickness. If you break health laws, even if Christ has died, you will still die. So health laws are still applicable. So when the Bible says to the law and to the testimony, what is the testimony? The testimony is anything apart from the law which the prophets have written. That's a testimony. And what are they testifying about? They are testifying to the goodness of God. They are testifying to the coming of the Messiah. They are testifying to his first coming. They are testifying to his second coming. They are testifying to the plan of salvation. What are they testifying about? It is the testimony of who? Of Jesus Christ. The scriptures are a testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why it says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. So there is no way a prophet living in 2020 can contradict a prophet who lived during the time of the apostles. Impossible. Because if the source is one, they all must speak the same language. If the spirit is the same spirit that inspired Moses, if the spirit is the same spirit that inspired the Apostle Paul, if the spirit is the same spirit that inspired Peter, if the spirit is the same that inspired John, it cannot come and give a wrong message to someone living in the year 2020. It cannot. God is not man that he should lie. No, the son of man that he should change his mind. So in 2020, God cannot come and change his mind and say, now it is okay to eat pork. Or that now it's okay, the Sabbath does not matter. So you see, just that one test, my brothers and sisters, 99% of the prophets out there have been disqualified. Because their message is not according to the law and the testimony. Their message does not speak according to the law and the testimony. Lamentations chapter 2 verse 9. The law is no more. What happens when the law is no more? Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. Did you get that? When the law is no more. Now the law being no more entails that the law is not respected or the law is not kept. When the law is not kept, there is no way those who are not keeping the law will find visions from the Lord. So, that context has to be understood as it is. 
the prophet will find no vision. Now, when we started earlier on, we read in the book of Samuel that Saul received neither visions nor dreams from God. Why? Because when Saul went to destroy the Amorites, he was told to destroy everything. What did he do? He disobeyed the Lord and he kept some of the fat cows for himself in a way of trying to say, no, this we are going to sacrifice. He disobeyed. The Lord told him, obedience is better than sacrifice. And because of that, because of disobedience, communication was cut off. So, the law is normal. The prophets also find no vision from the Lord. So, visions and dreams or the gift of prophecy cannot be given to those who do not keep the law of God. It cannot be given to those who don't keep the law of God. Now, if a teaching, okay, if any teaching or action deviates from the pattern prescribed in the revealed standard of truth, if any teaching or action deviates from the pattern prescribed in the revealed standard of truth, which is the Bible, it is to be recognized as coming from the realm of darkness rather than light. It, has, it is as clear as it is. And to demonstrate this, to demonstrate this, the Apostle Paul, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Prophets from God cannot contradict each other. The implication of that is God contradicting himself. Because the, ins the inspiration, the one who inspires these prophets with a message is God. The source of the message is God. So how can it be that you've got the same source of messages? This one is told, no, it's okay, uh, any day is the Sabbath. The other one is told, no, the Sabbath is the seventh day. How can it be God is not man that he should lie? And in just trying to demonstrate this, I'm going to pick just a small subject of death. How were the patriarchs, how were the prophets inspired in understanding the subject of death? Did they have different understanding of what happens to a human being when someone dies? And then you can compare with your understanding. If your understanding is not the same as that of the prophets, then your understanding is wrong. Job. What was the understanding of Job as far as the subject of death is? Did he say, did Job understand that when someone dies, they go to heaven? No, sir. Job chapter 14, verse 12. So man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So Job knew that death is asleep. The psalmist, what did he understand? The dead praise not the Lord. <clears throat> Neither any that go down into silence. So did the David understand that the dead go to heaven? No. He said the dead do not praise the Lord. Everyone who is in heaven praises the Lord. So the dead cannot be in heaven. Solomon, the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. He agrees with all the others that have gone before him. Isaiah, for the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pity cannot hope for thy truth. Did you get that? He agrees with the fact that those who are dead cannot praise the Lord. Why? Because they are dead. What else, my brothers and sisters? Ezekiel, the sower that sinneth, it shall die. Lazarus, what does he say? Lazarus sleepeth. Jesus, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus believed that death is asleep. What about the Apostle Paul? But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye settle not even as others which have no hope. So everyone is in harmony 
as far as the subject of death is concerned. So you, you cannot come and rise up in 2020 and say, no, when you die, you go to heaven. Your inspiration or your source of that light is from darkness, not from light. Test number two. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. By their what? By their fruits, you shall know them. So prophets do not go about sleeping with other people's wives. By their fruits, you shall know them. Holy men of God spark as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Prophets are not so much concerned getting involved, fully involved in politics. No, the one who's going to win is this one. No, the one who's going to... Prophets do not uh, get involved in those matters. They don't get involved in those matters. By their fruits, you shall know them. The fruits of the prophets are the fruits of the Spirit. The works that they do is to unite, to build the church, never to divide. The work of the prophet is to lead men and women to Jesus. The work of prophets is to exhort trust. The work of prophets is to exhort righteousness, and it is seen in their lives. The prophets of today steal from the congregants. The prophets that we have today, they give their congregants doom to drink. The prophets that we have today, they use unconventional methods, kissing other people's wives in the name of uh, casting demons. They cannot be from God. They have caught themselves. And I warn you, my brothers and sisters, if you are going to follow such kind of men, it is for your own destruction. Beware. The Bible says, Matthew chapter 7, 15 to 16, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits, how are we going to know them by their fruits, Lord? Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? No. The answer is definite no. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Inwardly, they are ravening wolves. These are out there to destroy the children of God. These are out there to deceive the children of God. Some and a lot of them for financial gain, for prosperity. They've got no respect for the word of God. No respect for the word of God. No respect for the Bible whatsoever. They don't even understand what the Bible says. Beware of false prophets. Those who have called themselves when the Lord has not called them. Beware of false prophets. Be skeptical, my brothers and sisters, of anyone who likes calling themselves a prophet. Be skeptical, be scared of anyone who likes calling themselves prophets. When you study the Bible, all prophets resisted being prophets. Because it is not an office for luxury. It's not an office where you sit like by the beach trying to sunbask. It is great work. It is being called to a higher standard. To become the mouthpiece of God on earth. It requires men and women of integrity. Higher than the highest is what God calls people to the office of the prophet. Because the standard to which they represent is infinite. But these men that we have today, that call themselves prophets, and there are a lot of them in Babylon. My brothers and sisters, they are just deceiving you. They are just there to deceive you. Test number three. A true prophet's prediction must come true. A true prophet's prediction must come true. Jeremiah chapter 28 verse 9. 
When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Did you get that? When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. Now, get this. Prediction is not the major work of prophet. But today, most people want to believe, make us believe that they are prophets by them predicting. Predicting the outcome of the election. Predicting the outcome of a football match. Predicting the outcome of this and that. They want to make us believe that they are true prophets. So that when they predict that Zambia will win the Africa Cup, and it happens that we should believe that they are prophets. No, sir. No, sir. To pass, to be a true prophet, you must pass all the tests, not just one. If there are seven tests of a prophet, it must be all the tests. If you predict and it comes to pass, but you teach contrary to the scriptures, you are not a true prophet. Because the devil has got the power to fulfill your prediction. The devil has got power to fulfill predictions of his prophets. That's the reason why prediction is not the major work of prophets. But in many instances, the prophets claimed that by divine inspiration, they had been given insight into the future. Part of the testing of a prophet is observing whether or not his predictions are fulfilled. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. Now this scripture is very important. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So if a prophet speaks something and it doesn't come to pass, the Bible says, do not be afraid of such kind of men. Do not be afraid. They just love titles of being called prophets. They are fake. Don't be worried about them. But there is a catch. It's possible for someone to predict something, it comes to pass, and yet they are still not true prophets. How does that work? I will show you from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 to 3. If there arise among you, again, remember, among you, not among the Philistines, no, among you. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. So the dreamer of dreams or the so-called prophet arises and what they predict comes to pass. Whereof he saith, he spoke unto this saying, let us go after other gods. So his prediction has come to pass, but he is telling us that we should worship on Sunday. His prediction has come to pass, but he is telling us that we should eat pork. His prediction has come to pass, but he's telling us that my brother who died many years ago is in heaven. Did you see the catch? Well, he spoke, saying, let us go after what? Other strange gods. That's where the catch is. So his prediction has come to pass, but where is he leading us? To other gods. He's not leading us to the creator of the heavens and the universe. He's not leading us to Yahweh. He's leading us to Babylon. He's leading us to Babylon. But his prediction has come to pass. <laughs> What's the catch there? What's the catch there? Why is he not a true prophet? Why has he felt even if his prediction has come to pass? 
because he has failed on test number one to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it's because there's no light in them so those of you that love predictions those of you that love miracles in the last days the devil will perform miracles but miracles are not a sign that the person performing them has been called by God let's finish Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 1 to 3 what exactly is the Bible trying to tell us here if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder and the sign of the wonder come to pass Whereof he spoke unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So, predictions... Do not prove that you are a prophet. You are a true prophet. You can predict the outcome of the Africa Cup or the World Cup. You can even predict the outcome of the elections. It doesn't matter. If you are not teaching according to the law and the testimony, you are not a true prophet. But at the same time also, it is possible for a true prophet's prediction not to come to pass. If it is condition. So, this test, my brothers and sisters, you need to be very careful with it. It is possible for a false prophet's prediction to come to pass, but he does not teach according to what is in the Bible. He's a false prophet still. Because the father, his de the devil, his father, the devil, can make it happen. But it is possible for a true prophet's prophecy not to come to pass if that prophecy was conditional. Conditional prophecy, Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 7 to 10. The Bible says, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build, to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I will benefit them. Did you get that? Yes. Conditional prophet. It's dependent on the happening or not happening of certain things. Do we have such kind of prophecies in the Bible? Oh yes. Nineveh is an example. Nineveh is an example of a conditional prophecy. Jonah, the true prophet of God, prophesied yet 40 days Nineveh will be what? Will be destroyed. Was Nineveh destroyed? The answer is no. Nineveh was not destroyed. Why? Because the king of Nineveh proclaimed a fast. And when he proclaimed a fast, the people of Nineveh repented of their sins. But I can assure you that Jonah didn't know didn't know. He may just said after 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed. He did not say if you do not repent Nineveh. No. He just said yet 40 days Nineveh. In other words a grace period to Nineveh was given 40 days for them. But within that 40 days they proclaimed the fast and God did not destroy Nineveh. After all these were people who did not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand. They didn't know. They thought this is their left hand when their left hand was the other side. They didn't know. Verse 9, in the book of Jonah, chapter 3, the Bible says, Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? This is what the king said. If we repent, who knows what God will do? He might perhaps just uh, turn from his anger. 
So condition of prophecy is dependent on the happening and not happening of certain things. And Jonah did not know, because in the book of Jonah chapter 4 verse 2, he says, Was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tashish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, you God are gracious, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. So I did not go want to go to Nineveh because I told them after 40 days, I tell them after 40 days, and then nothing happens. What do they think about me? They'll think I'm a false prophet. Because I didn't want them to think I'm a false prophet, I fled to Tashish. Because you, you are a merciful God. So, those of you brothers and sisters, I repeat, that love miracles. You believe with your eyes what you see. Your eyes, what you see. It's not everything that you see that is true. Sin is not always believing. What is true is the word of God. Whether you have seen or you have not seen, as long as it's the word of God, it is true. That's why the Apostle Peter spoke about we have a more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word of prophecy. You don't need to see your dead relatives to believe the state of the dead. You simply need to read the Bible. The Bible will tell you the dead know nothing. Believe the words of the prophets. Test number four. A true prophet edifies the church. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So a true prophet edifies the church. He builds the church. Members of the Christian community or the Christian church, they benefit from the message of the prophet and they benefit in all ways. They benefit spiritually, they benefit physically, they benefit marriage-wise, they benefit financial-wise, in all aspect, all things pertaining to godliness and life, God has given us through the prophets and in the gift of his son. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints. So perfection is God's will for you. This idea of always says no one is perfect. No one is perfect. Yes, no one is perfect. But perfection is God's will for you. We must all in Christ strive for perfection. We cannot give our humanity as an excuse for doing what is evil. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. A true prophet edifies the body of Christ. A true prophet perfects, helps in the perfection of the saints. Now you, you are a true prophet. You call yourself a true prophet, but you, your example is of indecent dress. You, are a, you call yourself a true but in a mean skirt, with painted lips and green hair. What example are you giving to the body of Christ? What will the young women think how they should dress?
Test number five. A true prophet exalts Christ as the Son of God. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Today, we have pastors and bishops and prophets, so-called prophets and teachers who do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yet the scriptures have told us whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. Now, in the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 27, you see that all the prophet's work is to point men and women to only but one, Jesus Christ. To exhort Jesus Christ, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Christ has always been the center of exhortation by all true prophets. Luke chapter 24, verse 7. And beginning at Moses. What is Moses? The law. What is Moses? The law. And all the prophets. What are all the prophets? The testimonies. The testimonies. To the law and to the testimony. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So all prophets, beginning at Moses, have all been pointing to one who is worthy, have all been pointing to Christ as the Son of God, have all been pointing to Christ as the Savior of the world. They've all been pointing that there is only life in one. They've all been pointing that only one can save. They've all been pointing and saying he's the only way, he's the only truth, he's the only life. There's no other ways, my brothers and sisters. There is no life no other way in Buddhism. There is no other way in Islam. There is no other way in Babylon. All the way. There is only one way and it's in Christ Jesus, the Son of God. And this has been the work of all the prophets. Moses, the law, and the testimonies. That's the reason why the gift of prophecy was given to point us all to the way of life. Who is Christ? the Son of God, Christ, the Savior of the world, Christ, the Creator, Christ, the desire of all the ages. Test number six. A true prophet must believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So number one, on the other side, there are others who say, no, Jesus Christ is not God. At the same time also, there are others who say, no, Jesus Christ was not a human being. So, two sides. Two sides. So on one angle, people are saying, Jesus Christ is not God. On the other side, people are saying that Jesus Christ was not human. But the scriptures testify otherwise. The scriptures are very clear that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is of God. 
At the same time also, the scriptures testify that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. If he came in the flesh, then he was human. So he was fully God and he was a fully human being. And that truth is of great importance for our salvation. As a human being, he feels our pain and he is able to succor, he is able to help us in our temptations. It behoved him to be made unto like his brethren in all things, that he might be able to help them that are tempted. For wherefore he was not made like unto the he was made like unto the children of who? Of Abraham. So Christ came in the flesh. He was fully human and he was fully God. Test number seven. A true prophet speaks with authority. A true prophet speaks with authority. And they must speak with authority. Because after all, what higher authority is there than God? Tell me, in the entire universe, what higher authority is there than God? And if you have been given a message by the king of the universe, why should you speak with timid? Why should you speak with fear? It's coming from the king of the universe. It must be given like that. As it is, without fear or favor. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So there's nothing to apologize about when you're taking the message of God. And Elijah the Tishbite said, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now, those of you that call yourselves prophets, you try, try to speak like Elijah. You will be embarrassed. Elijah was a true prophet. And he spoke with authority that came from God. So a true prophet speaks with authority. Today, because of time, I'm going to have a part two to this subject. So that we can follow each other in terms of the gift of prophecy. Test number eight. A true prophet will exhibit definite physical signs when in vision. Now this one, if it, there is no false prophet that can counter this one. You, you can, there can't be a counterfeit for this one. Because what happens to prophets when they are in vision? According to what this has been revealed in the scriptures, it is very difficult to counterfeit. Very difficult. The devil can't do it. It is only the prerogative of God who has all power. Now, what exactly happens to prophets? What signs do prophets show when they are in vision? So, A, a prophet's eyes are open during vision. So a prophet's eyes are open during vision. Numbers 24, verse 4. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. So someone goes in vision, but their eyes are open. Number two, a true prophet 
falls down, has no strength, is then strengthened, but has no breath. Even while speaking, while in vision. Now, when I say has no breath there, this is not a figurative speech to say I've got no, no, no breath. Like you are surprised or you are shocked. No. When we say no breath there, we literally mean no breath. Now tell me, the only person who has no breath in them is a dead person. But when we are dealing with the subject of prophets and we speak about no breath, we actually mean no breath. Daniel chapter 10. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great quacking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone and saw that great vision. And there remained no strength in me. And I retained no strength. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face. So, the Bible says Daniel was in a deep sleep on his face. So where was he? Where was Daniel there? He was on the ground. He was on the ground. Because you cannot say, deep sleep on my face. He was on the ground. I was a deep sleep on my face and my face towards the ground. Okay? What else happened? And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. And I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord for as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me. Neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man. And he strengthened me and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Ye be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened. Daniel chapter 10, 16 to 9. Now, when you read the Bible, you then realize that when the Bible is talking about I've got no strength, it's not the figure of speech. It's literally no strength. That's the reason why he falls on the ground. And deep on his face, facing the ground. So he has fallen down. Why? Because there is no strength in him. Number two, why has he fallen down? Because there is no breath in him. And because there is no breath in him, literally, he cannot breathe. This is not a person who is suffering from uh, pneumonia. This is a person who certain things have happened as he is falling into the vision there are certain things that take place at that instance that make it for him not to have strength and for him not to have breath. Now, let me explain this very clearly for you to understand. In order for someone to go into vision and carry the weight of the message that God is about to give that person, the person has to lose their natural strength. And when they lose their natural strength, God has to then strengthen them with supernatural power. When God strengthens them with supernatural power, even the breath that we breathe, this breath, the ruha, the nafash, the breath is removed. So the person can then not breathe using natural breath. What they then plugged in 
is they are plugged in into the supernatural power. So when they are plugged in, then God can then communicate to them in vision his message. This cannot be counterfeit. You cannot stay for a few minutes without breathing. But a prophet can be in vision for one hour, even two hours without breathing, without dying. Why? Because they are safe in the hands of God. They are safe in the hands of God. So in this presentation today, I will end on testing the prophets. I've given you the skills of how you can test prophets. A prophet has to be 100% in harmony with the teachings of the word of God. If he is not, it doesn't matter what they predict, even if it comes to pass, they are not true prophets of God. Prophets are always subject to other prophets. In other words, prophets that have already gone, that have already died, cannot contradict prof new prophets that have come. Or new prophets cannot contradict the old prophets. I've already given you that. A prophet bears good proof, by, fruits. By their fruits, you shall, know, you shall know them. The other thing is that prophets cannot arise outside Israel. Prophets always arise within Israel. Next week, we are going to go further and understand, did the gift of prophecy continue after John the Riverator, the one who wrote the last book of the Bible, did the gift of prophecy continue? Or is there the gift of prophecy outside the biblical canon? And then from there we are going to say, have there been prophets outside the Bible? And these are true prophets. I pray by the grace of God that you will stay tuned as we continue to share the great messages of God. And I hope that by this message you've been blessed and you've been helped in trying to understand not to be deceived by the so-called men of God out there. Righteous Father, we thank you for the privilege that you gave us to study the gift of prophecy. So far, O oh Lord, you've given us the skills that we need to identify true prophets. As you continue to give us breath once again, and when we come back, we shall continue with this subject. I pray that by this message, someone out there has been helped. Someone who was on the face of deception, someone who was in the trap of the devil, someone who was deceived by the so-called prophets of nowadays, has been helped by this message. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that this message is intended to lead us to the scriptures so that we can understand Jesus Christ, in whose name alone we pray. Amen.